We're hearing what an NFL legend and current star think about the changes coming to the game. Plus, the Big 12 isn't adding UConn just yet. Memphis just fired four members of its basketball staff. A soccer legend retires, and the golf world is seeing a major corporate divorce. It's Friday, September 6th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Today, we have conversations with Saints legend Drew Brees and New York Giants defender Dexter Lawrence II on today's NFL. We also have some big updates in the world of college sports. Alex Morgan is retiring, Callaway and Topgolf are decoupling, and we'll check in on the world of sports social media with our multimedia journalist, Daryl Barnes. First, here are your top headlines. Jerome Moore has not signed his contract with Michigan yet, despite already coaching the Wolverines to a win. Moore, the replacement for Jim Harbaugh, agreed upon a framework in January for a deal worth $30 million over five years, but Michigan AD Ward Manuel said on Thursday that Moore still hadn't signed the contract and that, quote, these things take time, there are things that have popped up, but they're being worked on. The money continues to flow into women's sports as Magic Johnson joined the investor group of NWSL's Washington Spirit on Thursday. The NWSL has skyrocketed in value since its launch as an eight-team league in 2013, with the league expected to announce a 16th team later this year, and Angel City FC reaching a $250 million valuation in July. Johnson is taking advantage of that growth by adding the spirit to his already massive portfolio of team stakes with minority ownerships in the Washington Commanders, LA Dodgers, LA Sparks, LAFC, and eSports Team Liquid. U.S. Women's National Team legend Alex Morgan announced her retirement yesterday. In a video posted to social media, she said, It has been a long time coming, and this decision wasn't easy, but at the beginning of 2024, I felt in my heart and soul that this was the last season that I would play soccer. Morgan, who is a two-time World Cup champion and Olympic gold medalist, will play her last game on Sunday for the San Diego Wave. The Commanders have fired VP Rael Antin in the wake of incriminating video that shows him making derogatory comments about NFL players, fans, and executives. As we covered on yesterday's show, the source of the video was an undercover reporter who matched with Antin on the dating app Hinge before shooting and releasing the video from their second date. Initially, the Commanders said they had suspended Antin, but now his employment has been terminated. The Norwegian men's national team received a visit from the country's anti-doping agency that was anything but routine. The agency requested urine samples from Erling Holland, Jorgen Strand Larsen, Antonio Nusa, Oscar Bob, Einar Gunderson, and Jorgen Juve. The catch, Gunderson and Juve have been dead since 1962 and 1983, respectively. Stale Solbakken, the Norwegian team's manager, responded to the summons with, Einar Gunderson and Jorgen Juve were summoned. It was a bit late. Negative tests on both of them. The anti-doping agency has since said that it was a mistake and they will review the routines going forward. Some big changes are coming to the NFL, and they will be a major adjustment for defensive players. I spoke to Giants defensive tackle Dexter Lawrence II on what he's expecting this season, his perspective on the league's growing popularity, and whether or not he's okay with an 18th game. I'm joined now by New York Giants defensive tackle Dexter Lawrence II. Welcome, Dexter. How you doing? Hey, great to have you on. So you got your first game of the season on Sunday against the Vikings. What's your mental state on the cusp of the season? Um, the, the whole season, uh, you know, I haven't really thought about the whole season in totality. Um, more just trying to honestly find a way to win week one and, um, you know, dominate week one. And I think that's the goal around the building. And I'm excited to, to go out there and, and go play with my friends, go, go have some fun with my friends. Yeah. And is this usually the best you feel, you know, for the season? You know, it's just like, you know, you don't have the, the wear and tear yet. Camp, camp is rough sometimes, um, some days, but um, like we got a little thing, like you're never really healthy <laughs> until maybe you retire. So, <laughs> so the NFL has some new rules coming in, like the new kickoff, and you know maybe most relevant to you, the, the taking out the hip drop tackle. Do you feel like the league did enough to kind of prepare and like help understand the players' perspective in making these changes? Um, yeah, they brought officials in um, to help explain more of what they would be looking for and how they would call it, things like that. So I think, um, you know, I think we understand what it is. I, if we, uh, But it, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like maybe you don't love the new tackle rule. No, nah, I mean, nah, it's nah, not, not too much. <laughs> not too much. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I mean, probably makes makes your job a little harder. Yeah. Um, and in already a pretty offense-heavy league. Um, 
I also understand you're doing some some work in your community off the field. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, so this year I'm working with uh, Campbell's, you know, uh, Chunky Sax Hunger. So uh, this is the third year of it, and um, I, I and honestly, um, you know, when my my guy brought it up to me, um, I was excited, more excited, just you know, to be on a commercial, and uh, you know, uh, you know, because you always watch the commercials growing up, but when you start learning the the ins and out of it, like what goes on behind it, you know, the cause of it is that that meant a little more to me. So um, I'm excited to work with work with uh, Campbell's this year. Um, it's different from the previous years. The previous years, the they the sacks of the 10 teams that they work with, you know, uh, donated uh, each sack was a thousand mils. But now it's every sack in the entire league. So that means more people's getting fed, uh, you know, so because more sacks are going to happen, obviously. So I think the the way it's going and the growth of it is, is amazing. And in that process of, you know, being on a commercial and just like, you know, having people, you know, turn you into this sort of public figure. Um, what was the most surprising thing for you throughout that process? Uh, the commercial or the shoot was a very long shoot, <laughs> but uh, I enjoyed every second of it. Um, just just because, you know, knowing what you're doing it for and, um, you know, the awareness that you bring in, um, you know, for, for the awareness you bring into a good cause. So I think that's what I'm most excited about. And, you know, um, I think I tell people I got a, a career in acting in the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you wouldn't be the first. And so the NFL is getting more popular every year. Is that something you can feel the difference as a player? That's a good question. Uh, I, I don't know, honestly. Um, you know, me, my, I just kind of go on the field and do my thing, and um, not not to get too much into uh, you know, the social media type of stuff. Uh, but I think obviously when you when you look back at the end of the season, and then you see all the all the like you kind of go back and see like oh like each year the growth in revenue for the league is, is amazing so um uh, that's that's so you kind of see it in that way but during the year you don't really feel it yeah i mean i guess if as long as you're staying away from social media it's like the game's the game right yeah. and um yeah. um yeah it's just only the people who are you know you know beefing with their fans on twitter i guess <laughs> yeah they're having the problems yeah yeah so the league you know is talking more and more about swapping out a preseason game and having an 18 game season. How would you feel about that? That would be rough, man. That would be rough. Uh, they, they kicked it to 17. <laughs> um, honestly, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm an advocate of, you know, taking care of your body and your mental health and all that. So, you know, what you gotta, I don't know. I feel like it's give and take all the time with, with when you start negotiating new things like that. So I don't know. It depends, you know, on the other side and what's the give and take is. And, and yeah, do you feel like, and also, you know, now teams are traveling internationally more and more. I know you mm -hmm. guys go to London. Does that, you know, I know it's exciting, but it feels like kind of the same thing where it's like more excitement, maybe more money, but, you know, a little extra toll on your body. Uh, do you feel like, you know, that's, that's something that the players are behind is, going to you know obviously we've got a game in brazil coming up um you feel like the players are, are into all that i think the experience and uh you know going to a different country and playing i think that's exciting um behind it and you know experiencing it. So some people have never been across the big waters so or been across the uh, you know travel to a different country so i think that's the, uh the experience that you know you get excited about and then obviously going to do what you love on the field what kind of reception do you feel like you get, you know, from from fans that don't have American football, you know, in their country? I don't know. This is I think they appreciate it a little more. Like they, well, you know, I played in London a couple of years ago, and the, and the fans were electric, uh, <laughs> and no team was really the home team per se, so it was good. Yeah, yeah. I, I spoke to Eli Manning a while back, and he said, you know, I was in the first London game, and the first time we went, you know, they would cheer for, like, punts or, like, yeah, you know, anytime yeah. there's, like, people, like, pushing each other. It was just, like, and now they cheer. And when, like, a third and one, they make the first down. And, like, yeah. it's, like, the, the knowledge of the game is mm -hmm. uh, increased over there. If you were commissioner for a day and, you know, you could maybe change the rules or change how, I don't know, change the schedule or just change what you want, uh, what would you like to do? It's... it's 
I don't know, honestly. Um, I do a little more homework on, you know, what exactly, you know, needs to be changed. Um, you know, but, you know, obviously hearing around the locker room and things like that, you know, um, you know, some guys say more vacation time or more, uh, you know, more money in a sense, you know, more um, better split uh, of the money, things like that. So I think I, w- I would push towards, uh, you know, making a little more player friendly probably. Yeah, we had a, a bunch of um, pretty high profile holdout situations um, this year. Um and, and you know, I feel like that's that's every year. There's there's a few like usually you know pretty star players who are saying you know I've got a contract, but I want a better one. Um, do you feel like that stuff just kind of inevitable? Like there's always going to be a couple guys in that situation, or I, I wonder if there's so. anything that could be done. I think so. You know, a lot of guys you know want what they earned or deserve, and um, so I think I think that's going to happen regardless of the fact. Um, but it's just, you know, it's always a, a good way to go about it. I think guys this year handled it pretty pretty well. The ones that I saw handled it pretty well. And, yeah, if you could just say a little more about that. Well, like, that, what was good about how they handled it? Um, I think it's just in the, in the case of, like, uh, like some of the guys I saw, you know, it wasn't like a whole, like, outburst or a whole da-da-da. You know, it's just more like I'm – I just I want what I deserve, so I'm show up. And I'm not gonna show up till I get what I deserve, and and you know the the hard work I put into the organization and you know things like that. Yeah, right. And, and I guess we still have one left, but everyone so far is, I think has gotten gotten a pretty big deal out of it. So yeah, sometimes the leverage sometimes is in the players' camp. I got one thing, man. I got one thing. I need everybody to, to go to chunkysaxhunger.com and purchase this beautiful, sexy shirt. You know. 20% of the proceeds go to, you know, also goes to Feeding the uh, Americans. So I'm excited about that. Feeding America. Sorry, Feeding America. Um, so I'm excited about that. And the shirt's comfy and it's sexy because it's on me, obviously. So go give it, go give it a buy. Well, really appreciate you taking the time to chat. Dexter Lawrence II, thanks so much for joining the show. Yep, thank you. The Big 12 is backing off the idea of bringing in UConn, at least for now. Commissioner Brett Yormark put out a statement that said, quote, following detailed discussions with my conference colleagues alongside UConn leadership, we have jointly decided to pause our conversations at this time. While Yormark is framing this as a mutual decision, my colleague Amanda Kristovich reports that it's mostly the Big 12 schools that are getting cold feet. UConn wants in and Yormark is interested, but the other schools would prefer the Huskies have more of a football program. One game probably wouldn't have changed the equation, but UConn getting blown out 50-7 by Maryland in the season opener couldn't have helped. The delay isn't all bad news for UConn. Staying in the Big East for longer lessens any exit fee the school would have to pay. A source told FOS that the fee would currently be around $15 million. Memphis basketball coach Penny Hardaway has let go of four staff members shortly before the start of the season, and while no reason was given for the dismissals, they come on the heels of Sports Illustrated obtaining an anonymous letter alleging recruiting violations by the program. The letter states that Hardaway himself was involved in violations around recruiting one player that came to Memphis and another who ultimately chose another school. Those happened in 2020 and 2022, and the letter also claims there were academic violations last school year. These issues aren't new for the former NBA guard. Hardaway was suspended for the first games last season due to recruiting violations connected to home visits in 2021. Senior Malcolm Dandridge missed five games last season while his eligibility was under investigation. The four departing staff make it nine total that have left since the end of last season. The marriage of Topgolf and Callaway has landed in the lake. Callaway bought Topgolf in 2020 with the merger completing in March of 2021. From there, the equipment and entertainment companies became more and more enmeshed to the point that Callaway changed its name to Topgolf Callaway two years ago. However, the company's stock has tumbled 38% over the last 12 months, prompting a strategic review of its business model. The two companies will continue to work together, and Callaway may retain around 20% of Topgolf. There are still a few paths Topgolf could go down, but it will likely become a standalone public company in the middle of next year. The broader question is what this means for off-course golf, which had a boom after the pandemic, but that industry may be recalibrating now. Eastern Kentucky intercepted Western Kentucky's annual theme game. WKU has a tradition of beginning every season with a whiteout. They wear white helmets, uniforms, and pants, and they make it a whole themed promotion. 
However, EKU told WKU on Tuesday that they would be exercising their right as visiting team to wear white, and NCAA rules forced WKU to switch to its regular red jerseys. Previous opponents have had that right as well, but generally they have let Western Kentucky have their theme game. WKU is still encouraging their fans to wear white, which might like make it look like they're cheering for the other team, but will keep the theme alive. It might be fun if the NCAA granted an exception to their uniform rules and let this be a true whiteout game, but that might get confusing for everyone. Drew Brees retired after the 2020 season with 13 Pro Bowls and a Super Bowl victory. Now he's staying busy with his investments and other projects. I spoke to him about what he's up to, today's NFL, and if he'd like to get back into broadcasting. That conversation is next. I'm joined now by the one and only Drew Brees. Welcome, Drew. How's it going? Great. Great to have you on. Um, so I saw that, you know, recently you invested in Sports Illustrated tickets. You also have investments in, you know, like machine learning companies, financial software, tonal, you know, some more like sporty things. Do you have like a team that you work with when you source investments? Like how, how do you find and pick companies you want to attach your name and your money to? No, it's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, I'm... Um... I think my, especially in my post career, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated with, um, uh, just aligning myself with, uh, incredible brands, companies, visions, um, and leaders and founders that I think share, uh, in a lot of those mission, vision values. Um, at the end of the day, it has to be authentic, um, and something that I, I, I feel really passionate about. Um, and I, I can't say enough great things about, you know, my relationship with sports illustrated tickets, the opportunity that I've been able to be an investor, a partner and ambassador, you know, someone that can really talk very passionately about the brand and what Sports Illustrated has meant to me throughout my career. But now the fact that we have a ticketing platform that um, really is second to none in regards to giving fans the opportunity to have access to every major um, sporting event um, and concert and you name it, um, relationships with, you know, all the four major uh, professional leagues in the U.S., every venue. Um, and, and, and really our differentiating factor being the fact that um, you know, we have the most transparent pricing process um, of any of the ticketing platforms. The price that you see is the price that you get. That is a fan's first approach. It's I think the worst thing for a fan is that when you see a price on a ticketing platform, and then by the time you get to check out, it's twice as much as than what you expected. Right. Um, that's not that's not the way we're going to do business. Um, what you see is what you get. And we're going to continue to build in fan experiences in and around the way that we deliver that product to to fans and and get them in in seats at the events that they really want to be at and that's that's what differentiates us with sports illustrated and that's why it's always been such an iconic brand and will continue to be yeah definitely and when you're a player you know did you have relationships i mean obviously you have some level of relationship with sports illustrated and all the other major media outlets but is you know is it more just like they're uh, something of a distraction or something you're obligated to do or you know when you, you see certain reporters and you know certain brands you say like oh, okay like you know I, yeah. i'm gonna um, have a certain sort of relationship to you no i look I, i've always looked at media as an opportunity to to tell your story right um to tell the story about your team to tell your personal story i mean just to use it as a positive right to be complimentary about you know your teammates to talk about your community to talk about things that that are important to you i think we live in a day and age with you know, media in general and all the different media channels and outlets where, man, everybody kind of has the opportunity to have a press conference at any moment. Right. And, um, you know, I think the way that fans consume information um, and content is is it's incredible. Right. And and I, look, I think it's also what's kind of driving like this desire and this demand for like live events, like people want to be in the moment. Right. They don't want to miss a moment or an opportunity. And look, I, I think that's awesome. I mean, for a guy who made a living for a long time playing professional sports and trying to deliver like a product and experience to uh, a fan base, right? Try to accomplish something incredible that everybody wanted to be in the seat, you know, to experience alongside us. Like that's that's what it's all about. And, you know, I saw you said recently that you want to get back into broadcasting if the opportunity is <laughs> there. Is that something you're actively pursuing? No, I... I I think the comment I made was that I, I think I could be the absolute best at it, you know, if given the opportunity, you know, um, man, I, I valued my time at NBC so much, you know, for that year um, after I played, um, you know, I spent most of that time in studio on Sunday night football, which having to work with some incredible people, Rob Highland as the producer and Mike Tirico. Um, uh, and, and I mean, Tony Dungy, like you name it, you know, so many incredible people. Um, 
but you know, I didn't really get the chance to broadcast NFL games, you know, and that's what I feel like I'm most qualified to do. That's what I feel like I'm most passionate about, you know, and certainly where my knowledge base lies, right. You know, is telling the story of the game, getting you inside the huddle, getting you inside the quarterback's head, letting you know how we're attacking this defense, man. Like, drawing exactly the matchup I'm looking at on every play because I know the offensive coordinator. I know the defensive coordinator. I know what they're thinking, right? I know what these players' strengths and weaknesses are, right? So, um, look, man, I mean, I think you can tell I'm, I'm pretty passionate about the game. Um, but, yeah, that's that, that, that to me is, is something I'd love to do down the road when the time is right. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, you, you have been in the booth, you know, at least a little bit. And there's another former MVP, Super Bowl winning QB about to have his first game in the booth. Any advice? who's been there look i think he's done it the right way you know he sat out a year i think he took time to just kind of you know relax and reflect a little bit and also prepare you know um i know he was kind of making the rounds you know being in the booth with different crews just kind of observing you know watching the process developing his formula there's definitely a formula to broadcasting games you know it's different than the manning cast or some of these others that are basically like a talk show you know as you're watching football like there's an actual formula to you know doing an nfl game or any you know football game, and I think everybody develops a little bit of their own twist to that formula, and they kind of have their own flavor and their own style. Um, and you try to learn from some of the best in the industry um, and guys that have been doing it a long time. But um, you know, at the end of the day, there's a knowledge base that Tom Brady has that very few people have, right? And there's some insight that you know I think there'll be a lot of golden nuggets, you know, with with each and every one of those broadcasts. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned the Manning cast. Those guys look like they're having a lot of fun doing it. It looks, you know, it's pretty relaxed. It's not like the intense um, thing of a, of a play by play where you have to, you've got your eight seconds to say what you actually eight seconds is probably too long. Anyway, is that something that you would be interested in if you, you found the right niche? Well, here's the thing. I mean, I, I think it's got to fit everyone's personality, right? I think the Manning cast is per perfect for Peyton and Eli, right? Like it gives them a chance to, you know, be together and the banter back and forth between them is, is, is hilarious at times, you know? And then obviously they have some really interesting guests that come on, right? And typically there's some affiliation with, you know, the, 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 the teams that are playing, you know, um, or some sort of a current event that they're able to, to, to discuss at the same time. Um, so, you know, there's, it's a totally different format, right? And it was it was groundbreaking, right? I mean, it's kind of the first of its kind. Um, but it just kind of, it, that's a perfect example of kind of where the sports media spectrum is going, you know, in regards to how fans are going to, like, interact with the game, listen to the game, you know, get their information. Um, it's uh, it's really an interesting time and, and leads to a ton of creativity. Yeah, absolutely. We'll have to leave it there. But Drew Brees, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Yeah, you got it. Thank you. The world of sports social media is abuzz with the start of the NFL season, plus the final game for a living legend is happening this weekend. My colleague Daryl Barnes joins us next to fill us in on what the sports world is talking about. Time now for our check-in on the world of sports social media with our multimedia reporter Daryl Barnes. Welcome, Daryl. Hey, Owen. How's it going? Great. How are you doing? Eh, doing good, doing good. And a lot of excitement around NFL this weekend. So ready to get yeah. things kicked off. Yeah, it's the season. So yeah, what are people talking about these days? So the big, the first big storyline is NFL's first ever game in South America. We got the Eagles and the Packers today in Brazil. Um, a lot of what's been talked about on social media is actually what the conversation isn't going to be on Twitter. That's because Brazil has this ban on Twitter. Um, it was the country recently banned Twitter amid, you know, a dispute with Elon Musk over misinformation. So you have a lot of beat reporters talking about, hey, NFL writers talking about, hey, I won't be able to, you know, deliver my information to fans the same type of way that I normally do on Sundays. So or on this case on Fridays. So that'll be something interesting to watch as you're as most fans will probably be tuning in on Peacock, uh, keep in mind that this is something that a lot of people seem to forget that this game exclusively on Peacock, uh, one of just a handful of games so far that have been exclusive on the platform. Twitter ban in Brazil is interesting. It kind of speaks to how like it's still the place where people or reporters go to like kind of get out their, their quick news. And also it's like, it's the conversation hub right now. And it's, even through all the issues that platform has been through, um, it's it's hard to move that entire national conversation to another spot. So it's still the spot. 
Yeah, everyone thought that Threads was going to be that big, you know, successor. And it's just not not quite the same. Not quite the same. Hasn't picked up in the same way as a news, you know, platform. And another topic you have for us is also about NFL broadcasting. But this one, everyone will be able to tune in. Yeah, this one is Tom Brady's booth debut. He'll be doing his, you know, game analysis alongside Kevin Burkhart. It's the first game of his $375 million contract. It'll be the Browns and Cowboys and... It'll just be interesting to see what we get out of Tom. You know, a lot of fans instantly fell in love with Tony Romo. Will Tom Brady have that same kind of effect? Will he be, you know, calling out plays before they happen or pointing out things in the coverage that the quarterback might go and try and pick apart? I feel like this has to be the most anticipated broadcast debut, at least that I can think of. And like probably in a few games, it'll just become normal. But for now, there's so much scrutiny. Like if he you know, gets a player's name wrong or something like I'm sure the, you know, the social media hounds will will be after him. Yeah, so that'll be one to keep an eye on. We'll probably get some fun dialogue on Twitter reacting to, you know, his first couple of his first couple of calls there. And uh, our, your last story for us, we've got a, another one about a living legend. After 15 years, U.S. soccer legend Alex Morgan officially calling it a career. Um, she posted a video um, yesterday announcing her retirement on X, said it wasn't quite the retirement video that she was expecting. She went into this 2024 season kind of knowing that it was going to be her last, but it was actually a surprise that kind of caused this announcement to come mid-season. She's pregnant with her second child, she announced in the video. And so a little bit of a celebration as it's also, you know, a bitter end um, to, to her career. Sure, it's a little bittersweet. I mean, you're talking an NWSL champion, two-time World Cup champ, Olympic gold medalist. I mean, the accolades go on and on. But she will play her final game on Sunday, September 8th, in what has been definitely one of the great careers in U.S. soccer. Yeah, I mean, she's been, you know, obviously hugely impactful on the field, but also off the field. I mean, she started her media company and has been one of the biggest advocates for um, improving pay and investment in women's sports. Uh, so, yeah, double congratulations to Alex Morgan on an incredible career and uh, second child on the way. Um, yeah. Before we let you go, uh, we've been running some some Twitter polls. We just started this. On our FOS Today account. So uh, I'll get your thoughts here. So uh, we've got two here. The first is what change are you paying attention to most this NFL season? I'll give you the choice to see what you think. Okay. New kickoff system, private equity investment, use of replay systems, and the new safety rules. What are you most interested in? I mean, it's got to be the kickoff, right? Everyone's like, it looks weird. You're watching games on Saturday and the kickoff looks normal. And then you turn on the NFL games and they're looking different i'm excited about like the new safety stuff especially like the new weird looking helmets um uh -huh. i feel like good about all that stuff but yeah the the new kickoff i'm just excited to see how it goes and like see the kickoff like come back as a thing that uh you know produces real action in the game uh we ran one other poll uh this week and it's just are you ready for football season your choices are yes or also yes can i click both <laughs> uh, no, no, you got to choose. I know it's a tough one. Uh, you know, I'll go with yes. Also, yes okay, probably okay. feels like, you know, the the like, ha, I'm going to do this one to be a rebel, you know, but no. <laughs> yeah, okay. yes. Yeah, yeah I mean, you're ready. with the majority there. I did pick also yes. So, um, but, you know, I guess that's, that's just my rebellious side, I suppose. Uh, but yeah, more of those coming. Check them out on our, our FOS Today Twitter feed. Daryl Barnes, thanks so much for joining us. And thank you, Owen. Always a pleasure. Time now for Front Office Sports Tomorrow, where we look ahead to what's coming up. ESPN is looking to integrate AI into written coverage of games. Fans aren't happy about it, but ESPN is going to do it anyway, for now. Thursday morning, ESPN announced incremental coverage for the NWSL and PLL that would use generative AI technology to create recaps for the games. According to ESPN Front Row, the company's PR platform, the initiative will begin this weekend. Fans are not happy, and even after ESPN deleted and reposted its initial announcement, Twitter users are making sure their thoughts are heard. At the time of this recording, the post has one of the worst ratios imaginable, with 581 combined replies or quote tweets to a measly 9 likes. The comments are brutal, as you can imagine, ranging from, nice work, this is effing garbage, with four fire emojis, to, can't wait to never read these recaps, to more sincere criticisms, but still with some fervor, like, how about you just pay writers, you soulless hacks? 
While it's true that ESPN has undergone some substantial reorganization recently, the company points to ESPN's commitment to embracing emerging technologies to drive innovation as a purposeful, responsible experimentation with AI technology, rather than cost-cutting, which they were relatively upfront about in the aftermath of RG3 and Sam Ponder being fired. The company also notes that AI-generated stories will be reviewed by a human editor. Maybe the public will come around eventually, but for now, the Twitter ratio speaks for itself. The NFL streaming landscape will look very different this season. Here's what you should know about it as the first weekend of action gets underway. Netflix will be in the fold this season, hosting its first ever set of Christmas Day games that feature the Chiefs at the Steelers and the Ravens at the Texans. Meanwhile, other streaming services that have been around for at least one season continue to cement themselves even further in the fabric of football's broadcasting rights. Amazon Prime will get its full slate of Thursday night football games, while Peacock gets its first ever regular season game tonight, featuring the Eagles and Packers in Brazil. The NBC streaming service is also expected to have another playoff game after setting a live streaming record with 23 million average viewers for last year's Dolphins Chiefs wildcard matchup. YouTube TV also scores big as NFL Sunday Ticket comes over from DirecTV, it's home for the past 28 years. Earlier in the summer, a judge threw out the $4.7 billion verdict against the NFL in a class action lawsuit over antitrust violations with its DirecTV partnership. Now Sunday Ticket TV for an additional $379 per year, plus the baseline $72.99 per month for access to the service, or you can purchase Sunday Ticket outside of YouTube TV for $4.79. Red Zone costs an additional $10 per month. Tom Brady will make his broadcasting debut at 425 on Sunday as the Browns host the Cowboys leading into the Sunday night football matchup between the LA Rams and the Detroit Lions. That's it for today. Send us your thoughts on the day's big stories by emailing today at frontofficesports.com and we might read your comments on the show. Thanks for listening. Enjoy your weekend. We'll see you on Monday.